Well, hi, hello, and welcome to Calvary Baptist Church's Weekend Worship Online. It is great to have you with us uh, this weekend as we've gathered as God's people to praise and to worship Him. Believe it or not, uh, another season has passed us by. I can't believe the days are flying by, the months are flying by, and we are in spring. Spring has sprung, and uh, believe it or not, um, it's, a new, it's a new time. Hard to tell in Oregon. Um, all that means is that it rains a little less. Uh, there's a little bit more sun, um, but at least on the calendar it says that there's springtime, and that does mean, uh, among other things, that there's new life. You can see it by noticing some of the buds on the trees and the bushes. Uh, we've actually got some flowers that are blooming here at Calvary Baptist, which adds to the, the Easter season, and as we think of Easter, we're reminded of another kind of new life, the new life that we have in Christ. You know, because of the free gift of grace, we have that uh, privilege of knowing what eternity holds for us. Now, of course, uh, because it's free doesn't mean there wasn't a cost. There was an incredible cost to Christ, but it's one that he freely endured out of love for us. And so it's in that recognition that he is a God that deeply loves us, uh, in part that calls us to worship him, to praise him, to adore him. We're going to do that in a variety of ways today, but we're going to start off uh, by looking at a song entitled, Worthy is the Lamb, certainly an appropriate title for our hearts and condition this day. And may our, uh, maybe our lips as we sing, but also um, our thoughts and minds be committed to that idea of praising and acknowledging the worthiness of our Savior. me 
our God. We're going to shift gears here uh, for just a few moments. We're going to go to a time and season of prayer. Uh, just a reminder, prayer is important to us here at Calvary. There's lots of avenues that you can utilize um, to share prayers or have others pray with you. You can contact the church office. We have a special designated phone number for that. Um, we can get you out on the prayer chain. If you come to the worship service, there's places you can put boxes you can put your prayer requests in. Um, we consider it an honor, an opportunity, a privilege to be able to pray with you. So please let us know if there's things going on in your life um, that we can partner with you in that. And with that recognition, um, as God's people, let's go before him in a time and a season of prayer. Let's pray. Almighty Father, how we thank you for this day. And how we do thank you for newness. Lord, it's part of what adds... Um, spice and variety to our lives, um, whether it be new clothes or uh, new jobs or a new season. Um, we are reminded, Father, that while those things um, uh, perhaps catch us uh, off guard by surprise occasionally, that none of it catches you by surprise. As we come before you this day, uh, we bring before you some, some concerns, some issues that we know you're already mindful of. And yet you tell us that you want to hear uh, these things brought by your people. And so we uh, think of some individuals. Uh, for example, we think of, of Ernie, Lord, who is struggling with COVID. Um, he was on the verge of, of having heart surgery, and that's had to be delayed, or maybe even it's going to be rearranged now. There's a possibility that they'll just do a stents. Um, instead of open heart surgery because of the COVID complication. And so we ask that you would be with Ernie, uh, God, that your hand of healing would be upon him as the doctors decide what path to pursue next. We pray for wisdom and discernment for them. We also pray for family, Lord. We pray for Penny and for Ginger and others um, that we know are concerned about um, what the, the, the things are that are going on in his life. And so uh, may your peace and serenity be with them as well. We thank Lord of Polly and of her sister, Penny. Penny has also has COVID, and um, so far, Lord, um, Polly has not caught that. That's our prayer, that she will be spared that, and so we just pray for a, a hedge of protection around her and for Penny. God, we ask that you would allow this virus to quickly run its course, um, that it can do what it does and then be uh, finished and behind her, and she can <clears throat> move back into her life without some of the physical symptoms, but as much as that without some of the limitations and restrictions that she has now. We pray for Jenny, Lord, as she continues to recover from her recent brain surgery and are grateful for the, the progress that's being made. <clears throat> we know, Lord, that this is just the first part of, of a two-part surgery. And, and so we ask that as quickly as, as possible, she might recover from this stage so that she might be able to move into the second stage and, and ultimately... Um, have these things uh, in the past behind her. But until that, we ask for just your divine touch upon her. We think of Sally, Lord, who is also recovering from surgery. Or in Sally's case, it's shoulder surgery. And so be with her as she continues to go through rehabilitation. God, we think of Michael, um, Darwin and Verna May's son, um, who had a significant surgery because of an infection that had gotten into his leg. Um, <clears throat> and he's home now with the... Um, the Durs, we just ask that you would allow that wound uh, to mend as quickly as is possible. We thank you for those that are providing care, whether it's medical care or rehabilitation. May those do what they're designed to do. And in the midst of all of this, Lord, we just pray in addition to the physical and that you would provide the emotional, that you would keep their spirits uplifted. Uh, God, that you would remind them that you are present with them. And then finally, God, we think of a member of our church who's not with us now, um, but who still remains kind or contains or um, arranges for contact with us. We think of Andrew, God, and um, he's just a, a special part of our life as a church. Uh, God, as he's in a new location, um, sometimes um, he doesn't have the visitors that he would like to have. And so we just ask that you would uh, hear his prayer, hear his cry, and, and help to arrange individuals, whether it's by phone or by um, actually visiting him so that he can renew some friendships, Lord, and have some individuals to have conversations with. Be with us now, God, as we continue on in your word this day. Um, help us to hear, help us to absorb all that you would reveal to us in this time. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, grab your Bibles. We are looking at God's Word. Hopefully this is uh, one of the highlights of the worship time for you. We're going to be looking at the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. Yes, we're continuing on in this book, but we're getting close. So hang in there just a few more weeks. And as we look at it this week, um, we find ourselves once more um, at the tail end, wrapping up what we've been calling the Upper Room Discourse. It's this conversation that Jesus has had with his disciples as they've had the Passover meal and now they're just uh, spending some moments prior to going to the garden uh, where Jesus will be arrested and then ultimately uh, crucified. And Jesus is using this time to give them some, some last minute teaching, some final instruction uh, before his departure uh, due to his death. And as a part of that really is, is the conclusion of this. We find ourselves in the 17th chapter today where Jesus is praying. He prays to the Father and he prays be, on behalf of really three different groups. He begins by praying for himself that the Son might glorify the Father and that the Father might glorify the Son in the midst of what is yet to come. He prays for the apostles that they might know that joy of the Lord and that they might be protected from the impact and influence of the evil one. And then he prays for a third group and that third group is for all of the believers beyond the apostles who were there then and who would come in the future. He's praying uh, for them a, a variety of things, but one of the themes that we see not only for that group, but really throughout the entirety of this prayer is a prayer for unity, a prayer for unity. So let's look to the text and see what it is that God would have to say to us about this idea in this final section of the 17th chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 20 through 23, so 17, 20 through 23, where we read these words. Jesus, of course, is the speaker. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Oh, we start with I, this idea, and really the, the entire focus today is going to be on this theme of unity. And we think about just the significance of unity and of the importance of it. Like many things, uh, unity is one of those, those concepts, one of those uh, realities that we don't really appreciate until it's not there. Um, I think it's that for that reason that we see that, that David writes this wonderful psalm, Psalm 133, in which he acknowledges the significance and the, uh, the wonder of unity. In that psalm, we read these things. How good and pleasant is it when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the beard, running down on the beard, down on the collar of his robe. It's as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. It begins by saying it's good and pleasant. It's good because it reflects even the nature of God, which we'll talk about in just a moment, but it's, it's pleasant because I think we all know that life is much more enjoyable when people are living in harmony with one another. Have you found that to be true? I know certainly I have. Maybe you've, in fact, had experiences in your life in the past, I hope it's the past, where you've had to be in situations where um, you were in a setting that was filled with strife or disunity or discord. Uh, for some people, uh, you maybe grew up in that. Uh, your mom and dad um, had a troubled marriage, and, and maybe there wasn't screaming, but there was shouting that, re that regularly took place, or... Um, maybe even worse wasn't the shouting, it was the silence, that, that silence that you could just cut through with a knife. Maybe you saw the discord in a work setting. Uh, maybe for you it, it's in a place where uh, some of the employees didn't get along with one another or the employees didn't get along with management. Maybe you saw it on a team. Um, uh, two players uh, struggled. They both wanted to be number one. Uh, people chose side and it created tension. Maybe it had to do with the coach. Uh, whatever it might be, if you've been in that setting, you know it's no fun. We're much more comfortable. We, we find ourselves much more um, at peace when we have that opportunity uh, to have unity uh, present. 
And as we look to the text here, we, uh, we see that, that David uh, describes this in some interesting terms. He begins by describing it as, as oil that, that flows down uh, from the head onto the, the beard and then the collar. Now, I have to tell you, when I first read this a number of years ago, that didn't sound very appealing to me. Um, I don't even like getting ketchup in my mustache, much less uh, stuff in a beard or that kind of thing. But when you look at it in its context, uh, you see that he's talking here about Aaron, the first priest uh, for the people of Israel. And as a part of what was done to acknowledge that, to celebrate that, uh, was a dedication. And that dedication involved in part a pouring of, of olive oil on his head that would flow down, that, that served to cover him, to anoint him. And when we see it in, in that way, we, we see that it's a holy thing. We see it's a sacred thing. We see it's a good thing that David's talking about. And then he makes the comparison of, of dew or water running down from the top of Mount Hermon. Uh, Mount Hermon is the tallest uh, site that there is in Israel. And it's uh, the mountain from which uh, so much of the, the water for other towns and villages flows ultimately throughout the summer. And so as he talks about this, really what he's talking about is this, this uh, liquid that provides nourishment, really that in many ways provides life, including uh, to the city of Jerusalem, the city of David as it would be uh, later known. Without that water, without that refreshment, in fact, Jerusalem would, would uh, truly struggle as we have seen some of our own uh, cities here in the U.S. with the, the recent uh, water problems that we have had. And if you take both of these in, in combination, one of the things they share is that both of these note things flowing down. A reminder to us that I think ongoing uh, unity, lasting unity, is something that only comes down from above comes down to us from God. Now, we can create temporary unity. We can have a common task or goal that we're trying to achieve. But once that's over, um, we have a difficult time remaining together. In fact, uh, humanity as a species uh, struggles with getting along. Uh, we see that just as we look back at history. I did a little homework on this and, and discovered that over the course of the last 13,000 years, and that's about as far back as archaeologists can reliably go, over the course of 13,000 years, there have been 10,624 wars and conflicts. That's almost one a year. Now, uh, fortunately, we've learned, right? I mean, we've had all that time to learn. Uh, we're wiser, we're smarter, we have more wisdom. Uh, certainly, we're doing things better now than they've ever done in the past, wouldn't you think? Well, I also discovered that the last time they compiled this kind of information was uh, 2021, and there were 40 wars and conflicts taking place during that one year. Instead of things getting better, it seems like in many ways they're getting worse. We struggle with being able to maintain a sense of unity. And sadly, that's not only in society in general, we see that within the church as well. And yet that's not what God wants. God is in God is in fact uh, himself a God of unity. Uh, he's a, a God that does not like division. Uh, we see this in, in the truth of, of uh, things of God that are really are revealed throughout the entirety of Scripture for us. We see, for example, that, that unity is a part of his very nature, um, his, his entity. He's a trinity. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as we talked about uh, last week. In, in John 17, 23, we, we read just a moment ago uh, that they may be one just as we are one. In his very essence, God reflects this idea of unity. We see it in, in creation, not, not so much creation at the very beginning, but, but ongoing creation of, of humanity, where the two become one. In Genesis 2.24, it says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. There's a unity that takes place there. We see in the Old Testament when God first established his people as the nation of Israel, he brought together 12 different tribes and formed them into this one entity uh, that we know as, as the people of God, the Jews. We see in the New Testament um, as the church is being formed that there's some, there's some tension that exists between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul has this to say for us in Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace who has made the two groups, Jews and Gentiles, has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside his flesh, 
the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to recreate in himself one humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them through the cross. We see all over the place that God is a God of unity. That's his desire. And so his objective for us as his people, especially within the churches, is to unite. He does that in order to bring us to a place of oneness. He does that in order to completeness, complete us. Because he knows that Satan's objective is to divide, to divide us. He knows that as we're divided, that ultimately it will lead to our destruction. Satan knows that. Jesus knows that as well. And so we read in Matthew 12, 25, these words. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And every city or household divided against itself will not stand. That's true of the things of the evil one. That's also true of the things of God. He strives for it. He wants us to be a people of unity. In fact, I don't think it would be too strong to say that God hates a divisiveness among his people. In Proverbs, uh, the 6th chapter, verses 16 and 19, it says, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable him. And then it goes through and listed. But the very last one in that list is this, And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. In fact, uh, God feels so strongly about this that he gives some, uh, some pretty direct instruction. If we look to the New Testament, the book of Titus, uh, the third chapter, it says, Warn a divisive person once, and then warn them a second time, and after that, have nothing to do with them. See, God knows that that, that divisive person is, is in some ways like a, a cancer within the body of Christ. And there's times when it comes to cancer that you just have to remove it. Now, the thing that's different about the body of Christ is that there's always opportunity for restoration to take place. But sometimes there's a season, sometimes there, uh, there's a need to, to remove that divisiveness for the health, the sake of the body. We see that God, in addition to, uh, to hating divisiveness, also is a God who wants to make sure that we move toward this sense of, of being a unified body of believers, a unified uh, community. And so let's talk for just a moment about what, uh, what biblical or godly unity is. And, and in fact, let me start even before that and talk about what it's not. Biblical unity is not just getting along whatever the cost there's a misunderstanding today, I think, that, that equates uh, acceptance with unity. It's similar to the, the misunderstanding that we have in conjunction with the word love. The world, I think, today asserts that, that unity means that we accept everything from everybody. And Jesus was in many ways of accepting of a lot of things. He was accepting of the lost. He was accepting of the deceived. He was accepting of misled people. But he was not accepting of, nor was he tolerant of, sin. In, in fact, he was so intolerant of sinful lives that he chose to die for our sins so that he would free us from the bondage of sin so that we no longer have to bear the consequences of sin in our lives, which is eternal separation from our Father. There are consequences to our sinful decisions and beliefs. And if we tell others differently, well, folks, we're just not being loving toward them. And I get so frustrated, I get so angry at the way that Satan has perverted and, and, and manipulated the words of love and uh, of unity and of non-judgmentalism. You know, if, if you have a friend that's an alcoholic, maybe the person's a co-worker, and he's had a tough week, it's just been tough in the workplace, maybe tough at home, and there's nothing more that this guy would rather have than a good stiff drink. Is it a loving thing to do to go and buy him a bottle of whiskey? Or suppose you, got a, you have a little boy, he's five years old, and he loves demolition derby. Man, he can't get enough of it. Is it the loving thing to do where on his fifth birthday you hand him the car keys to your car and say, son, go and have fun for the afternoon. Is that a loving thing to do? Well, of course not. In fact, the truth is it's unloving in both cases. 
The loving thing to do would be to, to sit there beside the individual who's struggling uh, with alcoholism and having a rough week or maybe get in contact with their AA sponsor so that they can help them. The loving thing to do would be maybe to buy your son some Tonka trunks, some metal ones that he can crash together, still have the fun of seeing that, but, but not put himself or at others at risk as well. Folks, we need to realize that, that unity um, is not the same as acceptance. We also need to know that unity doesn't mean uniformity or unanimity. Um, we can be strong followers of Jesus and still have different points of view, different perspectives, but, and even in some areas, uh, different beliefs. I think about that idea of marriage. Um, you know, again, we've already talked about the fact that Scripture says that, that there's to be unity. There's supposed to be that sense of oneness. And yet I know I can ask the husband. I'm not a wife, so I can't say for sure there. But I know I can ask the husband, oh, would you say, guys, that you're exactly the same as your wives? <laughs> I know the answer to that one. No, we're, we're different. There's gender differences. There's life experiences differences. There's uh, personal beliefs and, and preference differences that go along with that. And yet we can still be one, Scripture says. We can still have a successful marriage that works. What we discover is that successful marriages like unity occur when we allow these differences that exist, and they do exist. But we use them in a way that they're complementary toward one another rather than being a divisive or conflictive or, or destructive. So if those are what unity isn't, what is unity then? Well, we see that unity is, is something that's centered on the word of Christ, or centered on Christ and on his word, I should say. It's centered on Christ. And again, the 17th chapter, the 22nd verse, we read this, that they may be one as we are one. Jesus talking here about, about the, the body of believers, the church becoming one as, as he is one with the Father and one with the Holy Spirit. That's the goal. That's what, we, that's what we strive for. We want to be centered on Christ as we think about this unity. But we also want to be centered on His Word. Another passage for us in the 17th chapter, verses 16 and 17, it says, They are not of this world, even as I am not of it. So sanctify them by the truth, for your Word is truth. It says that we're, we're not uh, of this world. Well, folks... We know that. This was never intended to be our forever home. We're just sort of passing through this earthly existence. But we become sanctified uh, by the learning and embracing of the truths that are revealed to us in God's Word in order that we might become focused appropriately, which means focused on God, focused on others, rather than uh, focused uh, primarily on ourselves. I love a, a definition or a description of, of unity that I came across in, in preparation for this weekend. And it described unity in this way. It says, unity is diversity with harmony. I love the way that that captures that. It's, it's saying that we need to make sure that our differences work in a complementary way rather than a, a competitive or destructive way. Again, I think a great example of that is, is an orchestra. If you think about an, an orchestra, you know, if you've got all of these very skilled people, uh, they're playing, but if they play the exact same note in the exact same way throughout the entirety of the, of the piece, it's just boring. There's nothing that's great about that. On the other hand, if you get these same people or a different group of people and they play completely different notes in whatever way they want to play, whatever notes they want to play, well, then you've got painful chaos. What actually works is when these different individuals who have these skills and abilities combine those things. They use those, those instruments in order to play varying notes, all of which are complementary to one another and to the score. That's what God calls us to as His people. Paul talks about the, the church being like a human body made up of a variety of different uh, parts. Some of us are hands, some of us are ears, some of us are our knees. And yet it's only as all of these parts come together that the body is complete in the way that God would intend. There is a richness that we can find in diversity as, as is there. In fact, I would say the church is stronger because of the, the differences that are there in the church, the personalities, the gifts, the talents, the abilities. However, uh, all of those differences must be brought into harmony under the lordship of Christ for the common cause of the kingdom of God. 1 Peter 3, 8 says it this way. 
finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic, love as brothers, be compassionate and humble. And so as we look at this idea of, uh, of unity, we see that it's important to God that it reflects who he is. It's what he's called us uh, to be. And what is it that, that fosters unity? What is it that helps us then to achieve this idea of unity? Well, if I, if I knew this in its entirety and could put this in a book, I would be a gazillionaire uh, because humanity has struggled with this throughout its entire existence. But here are four principles I think that would help greatly within the church for us to be a more unified people than too often we find today. First, we need to set unity as a goal. We need to strive for unity. You see, there's few things in, in life that, that just happen by chance. We, we tend to aim or hit what we aim for. So if you, you want to be... Um, you want to be in better shape or you want to be thinner. You do that because you exercise and, and you don't uh, eat as much. If you want to be uh, skilled in some new ability or, or pick up a new, um, maybe a new habit or, or craft or hobby, you do that by doing some homework and practicing the skills over and over again that make you an expert at that. If, if you want to learn a new subject, you do that by reading the books and, and studying the text. In each of those cases, you have to be deliberate. Well, I think the same thing is true about unity. And yet it's worth it. Remember David's words in Psalm 133? How good and pleasing it is when God's people live together in unity. First off, we, uh, we need to strive, we need to aim, we need to work toward unity. Second, uh, we need to focus on being other-centeredness rather than self-centeredness. And again, we see Jesus being the, the prime example of this. If we look to his life, he left the, the splendor of heaven to come down to this imperfect world, living among imperfect people for a season, ultimately to give his life for the very people who were shouting for his death. I don't know how you get more other person focused than that. You know, if you, you take a bunch of guys and uh, they're only concerned about themselves and you put them on a, a basketball court or some kind of a field and you just sort of leave them there, what you end up with is a, is a bunch of guys who are each kind of doing their own thing. But if you take a bunch of guys who are concerned about others, who are other person focused, and you put them on a court or, or a field, what you end up with is a team. Folks, that's what God calls us to, is to be this, this team that are unified in their, their work to build up God and his kingdom. So we want to make sure, uh, first off, that we uh, aim for this idea of, of being um, unified people. That's our goal. We, we say, second, that we want to make sure that we're a people that are other person focused. Thirdly, uh, we need to, to engage in forgiveness, forgiving others that have wronged us. Remember Jesus' words as we move toward Easter season here. They're on the cross just before he died. He had this to say of the very people that had just uh, been responsible for his death. He said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. If Jesus can forgive those who killed him, surely we can uh, forgive any of those who have offended us. And then finally, in addition to forgiving others, we need to ask others to forgive us those that we have wronged. Remember the prodigal son, how he returned to the father? Now I know, I get it. It's not easy to do that. It's humbling, it's hard, it's uncomfortable. But folks, it's necessary. It's necessary for us to go to those that we have wronged and ask for their forgiveness if we truly want to achieve unity. So as we leave here today, I've given you quite a bit uh, to take with you. So let me just kind of recap it. First off, we've talked about the fact that uh, unity is hugely important to God, that he's a God of unity, that he hates divisiveness. We've talked about the fact that um, uh, godly unity doesn't mean that we embrace every teaching or philosophy or lifestyle, and instead we remain true to the principles and teachings revealed to us by God. It also means that we don't try to become spiritual clones of, of one another, that instead we acknowledge and celebrate uh, and even um, sort of utilize those differences that exist between us. We talked about the fact that godly unity is centered on Christ and his word and that it uh, finds harmony in the midst of God's diverse people. And finally, we discovered that uh, unity can be there if we take some steps toward it, if we make it a goal, if we uh, are gracious enough to forgive, if we focus on others, and if we are humble enough to ask others to forgive us as well. 
I want to wrap up with one story. It's, it's just kind of a, a, a cute story here. It's by a, a guy named Max Lucado, um, one of my favorite authors, if you just want um, a unique perspective. He, he's able to capture incredible truths um, in a wonderful storytelling kind of way. He tells this story in one of his books, a book entitled The Gentle Thunder, um, and I think you'll see the connection between unity or maybe disunity. Listen. Some time ago, he writes, I came a, upon a fellow on a trip who was carrying his Bible. Are you a believer? I asked him. Yes, the other man said excitedly. Uh, now I've learned personally that you can't be too careful with who you fellowship with. So I began to ask him some questions. Do you believe in the virgin birth? I asked. I do, he said. Do you believe in the deity of Christ? No doubt, he replied. Could it be, I wondered, that I was face to face with a real Christian brother? Nevertheless, I continued down my checklist. Do you believe in the return of Christ? I believe it's imminent, was the response. What about the Bible? It's inspired, was his answer. Now I was getting excited. Are you a conservative or a liberal? He was getting interested in me too. I'm a conservative. I asked him as my heart began to beat faster, what denomination are you a part of? He said, I'm a member of the Southern Congregationalist Holy Son of God Dispensationalist Triune Convention. And now I'm really excited because that was my denomination. And I asked him, what branch of the denomination are you? And he said, I'm part of the premillennial, post-tribulation, non-charismatic, King James One Cup communion branch. And my eyes misted over. That was my branch as well. I only had one other question. I said, is your pulpit wooden or plexiglass? Plexiglass, he replied. Slowly I stepped back in dismay and sladly turned and walked away, whispering under my breath, heathen. <laughs> Folks, uh, we share so much together as God's people. He desires for there to be a sense of unity among us. May we hold true to those things uh, that unite us and those things that define us as God's people. But may we all be, also be gracious um, to realize that there is diversity in the body, to acknowledge that, in fact, even to celebrate that. May we do that this day, and may we do that every day. Amen. You dance over me while I am unaware. You sing all.
Okay, we're going to move toward wrapping things up. Love the song um, that you just heard. I hope you sang, you know it. Um, and what a wonderful, powerful reminder to us of how amazing our God is. Um, in fact, sometimes that song just brings tears to my eyes as I really think about um, what an extraordinary God he is. Um, we're going to pray in just a moment. Before we do that, I just want to uh, make mention again, we're into the, uh, the Lenten Easter season. So for us as a church, next thing on the calendar is our Easter egg hunt on April 1st. I would love for you to be a part of that. Uh, for all of you that maybe helped fill some eggs, thanks so much for that. But we need people. We need individuals that not only can help on that day, but just to be God's presence, to be God's people uh, in the midst of the folks, to greet them with a smile, to let them know, um, yeah, you can be a Christian and be normal. Um, so we would love for you to be a part of that. If you've got time that morning, that starts at 10 o'clock. Um, won't go super long, but if you can come and be a part of that, uh, contact Deb or let the church office know, and we would appreciate that. With that, um, thanks again for joining with us. Hope it has been a meaningful time of worship with you. And uh, if you would, bow with me and we'll close in a final word of prayer this day. Almighty Father, how we thank you for the, the, the privilege of being in your presence, uh, of singing songs of, of praise and that exalt and, and acknowledge and worship you, of, of coming before you in prayer, uh, recognizing um, our ongoing need for your presence in our life. Looking to your word where you reveal to us those wonderful, powerful truths. Today, thinking about the idea of unity and how that should be one of the marks of your people, of your church. Help us, Lord, to live that out. As we uh, go our own ways here in just a moment, Lord, we pray that you'd go with us. Watch over us, God. Use us in whatever you have in store for us, not just this day, but in the coming week. May our actions, may our words, maybe even our thoughts, Lord, convey and reflect the joy, the peace that comes from being a follower of yours. Thank you again for this time together. And we pray all of these things in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.